go, here we go, here we come and go, here we come and go, here we come and go. Here we go, here we go. Here we go, here we come and go. Here we go, here we go, here we come and go, here we come and go, here we come and go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go, here we come and go, here we come and go, here we come and go. Hello and welcome to another episode of Containers from the Couch. I am Justin Garrison and today with me we have uh, Redundant Jeremy's and a Kyle. So (laughs) thanks everyone for coming. Uh, We're talking about Dagger today which allows you to declare CICD pipelines with code. Uh, So Jeremy uh, Cowan, go ahead and say hello to everyone. And uh... Uh, Hey folks, Uh, I'm Jeremy Cowan. I am a developer advocate here at uh, AWS. Nice to be with you. And let's fail over to the other Jeremy. Uh, what, <laughs> what, what do you do over at Dagger? Hey, everybody. Um, I am Jeremy Adams. I head up the ecosystem at Dagger. Awesome. And Kyle, how about you? Yeah, I'm Kyle. I'm on the ecosystem team. Um, you see me doing lots of videos and demos with Dagger stuff. Nice. And Dagger is a fairly new tool in the scene. Um, it's not something that I know. I, I remember when it was being announced and I was really excited about uh, seeing what Solomon was doing and taking this sort of like containers are just the way to do everything. And if it's not a container, like what are we doing? And so, uh, Jeremy, do you have like a, a quick overview of, of kind of what Dagger is and, and how it works? Yo, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Justin, maybe if I share my screen for a sec. Yeah, let's pull it. Uh, a little view here. Yeah. Perfect. So um, for anyone that's following along from home, this is the dagger.io website. So you can kind of check this out uh, at your own pace. But essentially, the thing to take away about Dagger is that Dagger is a programmable CICD engine. So think of that programmable, think of that engine bit, right? So we're running your CICD pipelines in containers, and we're writing them in code. So these pipelines are meant to be in whatever language you're developing the rest of your application or the rest of your tooling in. So if you're thinking Golang, awesome. That's what we're going to show today. Uh, If you're looking for something else, we've actually got a form here where you can submit what you're interested in seeing. But expect things coming down the line, such as Python, TypeScript, et cetera, et cetera, right? So anything you might be developing your tooling or your applications in today, that's what you'll be developing your pipelines in with Dagger. And what we'll see from Kyle today in some demos is using the Dagger SDKs, today it'll be the Golang SDK, you talk to the Dagger engine, which has an API for doing things like pulling in Git repos, pulling container images, executing things within them, pulling in files, sending things out, And through that, you can create as many pipelines as you need to perform whatever your CICD tasks are. And you can read back the outputs of those and make those inputs to other pipelines. So that's kind of a flavor of the sorts of things we're going to be seeing from Kyle in the demos today. Now, two questions from that. Uh, First of all, how is this different than I have a Jenkins uh, server, I have plugins that do that pull and get repos, that sort of stuff. Like that's a big question. And second is, is Groovy going to be supported as a language? Can I go a full circle back to writing Jenkins files uh, for Dagger? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the way to think about this is we're not, we're not taking over your CI runner that you have today. So if you're on Jenkins, if you're on AWS code build and code pipeline, if you're on GitHub Action, Circle CI, GitLab, whatever, we, you just use Dagger inside of that CI environment, and it's the, the, what allows you to actually run things locally as well. So you get true portability with containers, right? And the fact that it's in code, you can run this right from your laptop, or you can drop it easily into whatever CI runner that you're using today. And uh, the language SDKs will allow you to use whatever your favorite language is. Um, Another cool thing is you'll actually be able to have, um, and this will be something coming down the line that we can talk more about, but you can actually have different teams writing their pipelines in their own language and sharing them cross language. So anyway, that's something that's coming down the line. If you really want Groovy, 
that's an option. Actually, we have that form up there. So drop Groovy in there or Java or whatever you want if you wanted to go fully full circle. Um, I haven't seen that yet as a submission, but maybe we will now. If, if anyone is watching live and, and Groovy is your favorite language, please let us know. Um, I'd be fascinated to have a conversation <laughs> with you on, on what you uh, like about it. Um, it's never one that I uh, enjoyed. And as, as fast as possible, I would either make it uh, execute a make file or bash scripts is pretty much um, what I wanted. That's really fascinating though, to hear that you could cross cross integrate with other languages because that's always been the, the challenge of oh we have this base language that ever like this layer of the stack is written in it's hcl it's groovy it's something that's like everyone has to learn this much of it to be able to be productive but really that like it's code like we should be able to share some of those resources and and one of the benefits of of that shared language could be extended upon if other languages could then say like oh have my typescript call out my my go Exactly. Yeah, this, and that's what you heard from people that are running platform teams or platform engineering teams and uh, DevOps teams, etc. They said, "Hey, I actually have to support developers. Maybe we're in one mono repo, and there might be multiple languages there. Or I just, you know, we have we have all these languages. I have to support them. Nobody's going to write this, you know, whatever the groovy that I'm maintaining, or no one's going to write whatever language I've chosen necessarily. If I want to get them on board, I have to meet them where they're at in the language of their choice. So." That's what we're yeah. hearing. So would, would this allow you to create uh, uh, modular pipelines or composable pipelines uh, from different, I don't know how you would refer to them necessarily, like uh, libraries, like language libraries or? Absolutely. Is that, is that the idea? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So yeah, you, there'll be actually, uh, again, something that's kind of coming down the line that we'll talk more about in the future. But you can imagine that there'll be ways to package up a pipeline that's maybe written in Golang or one written in TypeScript and share that in some way and kind of like pull that in. Um, because what you're really doing when you're talking to the Dagger engine is you're talking to this, to this API. And when the core API, we can do all those things like talking to Git and containers and pulling file systems and executing things. But imagine like if you took a set of those things and maybe even you pulled in some, you know, libraries or packages like if I pull in the AWS SDK, for example, what are the things I could build with that plus doing things in containers, right? And then could I share that as some standard piece that we use inside our company? The answer is yes, and um, that's where we're going. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so I know Kyle has a demo. Do we want to jump right into that? Uh, yeah, let's go, Kyle. It. Yeah? Yeah. All right, let's do it. All right, so today we're going to use the, the Dagger Go SDK that we just launched uh, to build a few pipelines. Um, so the first pipeline, we're going to build, push, and deploy a container onto ECS, and we'll have a look at that. Uh, we're going to run some uh, test pipelines and run those uh, both locally and also in GitHub Actions and on CircleCI. Uh, so you can see the, the portability aspect of the Dagger engine. And then we're going to run kind of the same pipeline from the beginning. Uh, but we're going to push to EKS instead. So let's dive right into our application here. So we have a Go application, and this is just a simple web service. It listens at a route, uh, it listens on a port, and it returns a greeting. So we've got this application right now deployed onto ECS Fargate. So if I look at my Terraform for my application real quick, uh, it just uses this simple Terraform module that deploys my ECS task. Um, and we can just kind of look at, uh, you know, this infrastructure deployed. We've got um, an ECS Fargate service. We've got our cluster. We've got our task. We've got a load balancer, all the things you need to run a web service um, from like just a, a HP container. So we'll go ahead and look at that running right now. And we can see it returned hello. And this is our endpoint that we're listening at, this greetings endpoint. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to make a change to this service. And then with our Dagger pipeline, we're going to build our new image and deploy that to ECS. So real quick, let's make our change. And we're going to say, hello, ECS. And then over here in our terminal, we're actually going to run our pipeline right on our machine the same way that it would run in any CI environment. Right, so if I say go run, and I've got a few different CI tasks defined, uh, but this one we're going to do right now is push. So we're going to build this image and push it. 
And then as it's deploying, we'll actually walk through this pipeline and see what it's doing. So we see things happening. Let's go ahead and take a peek at that uh, pipeline now. That yeah. piece of the pipeline um, running in containers, is there limitations there if I say need to create a container, um, right? Like a lot of people use Docker and Docker to, to build those containers and they're doing that on top of Kubernetes. Are you relying on that infrastructure locally on your laptop right now? Yeah, so right now I have um, a, a local Docker image that's running that's actually my, my Dagger engine. And right. so that's what I'm communicating with. Those are kind of my only dependencies to run this pipeline is I'm running a Go pipeline. So I need some way to run that Go code. So I need Go. And then I need to run the engine in a container. And so any container runtime where my engine can exist um, on my machine right now, um, that's my, my two dependencies. Cool. So going over to this pipeline, we saw it was running push. Um, and real quick, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm demoing this from an M1 MacBook Pro. So I have a, an ARM64 uh, architecture CPU and I know with Fargate, we can deploy to, uh, to x86 or ARM. Uh, so we're building this multi-arch image with our application in it so that we can deploy anywhere that, that our Fargate supported. So uh, first thing we've done here is we've defined kind of our, our build matrix, if you will, of what these two targets are for our container. And then as we step through this pipeline, you'll see how those are pulled in with the Dagger SDK to actually build this uh, multi-arch container. And so first thing we're doing in this pipeline is we're connecting to the Dagger engine. So I, I mentioned earlier that we have this um, engine running on in, in my context that has um, the API that Jeremy mentioned that we can talk to. So I've created a client for that uh, engine. And then just like you would do in you know, your YAML workflow, first thing you want to do is reference your source that you're actually building. So the first thing I've done here is uh, created this variable in Go, right? That's that's saying get my host worker, and this is where my project lives. This is where that main.go was. And then we're going to iterate through those platforms that we're targeting for our container. Um, and so for each of these, if I scroll back up, uh, for each of these Linux AMD 64, Linux ARM 64, we're going to build the specific image for that platform. And then this is our actual builder here. So if you've worked with um, Docker files before or multi-stage builds, this process probably looks really familiar, but we're actually doing it in code uh, rather than in um, some other syntax that it, that's not specific to my uh, ecosystem, right? So the first thing I'm doing here is grabbing a reference to a container. And I'm saying that container should be from Golang Latest. So already I, I've got this container that has Golang. That's what I need to build my application. And so next up, we're going to say with mounted directory at slash source, we're going to mount that directory. Remember that was our, our host's working directory. And then we're going to set that container's work there to source so that when we run commands in that container, we're going to run it from that context of where we just mounted our code. Uh, we're going to set some environment variables for our code. So again, earlier um, we talked about like, can you reuse components um, across pipelines and create these reusable pieces? Uh, in like a real world ecosystem, you probably have this, this whole builder is something that you share across your whole project or your whole organization, right? It's like, this is the standard way that our team does go builds. And now you don't have to redefine these environments every time you're building something. Um, and then we're actually setting the go arch here because again, we're doing this multi-platform build. So, here, this specific build is going to be for a particular architecture. And then we're going to say go build, and this is our, our, our build output. So this is our binary that we've built uh, within this container. So from, yeah, go ahead. I was, I was going to ask if um, <clears throat> it's possible to pull in this code from a Git repository. So I, I see that you're getting it from your local machine here, but um, is there an ability to uh, retrieve the, the code files from uh, an external source? Yeah, definitely. So um, if you wanted to build like an external project, we can actually, let's look at this SDK real quick on, um, on the Go docs. Uh, and let me make this way bigger for you. Yeah. And we lost our sidebar. Um, That's all right. <laughs> so, so if we uh, pull in instead, let's jump to get, um, 
So up here, like where we grabbed our, our host worker, instead we could grab a git ref and say, this repository on GitHub that I want to build, clone this and clone this particular branch or tag um, and give me that directory instead of my local directory, right? So it, it is really whatever you want to pull in. So in this case, we're nice. building this, this local file, but yeah, you can pull in Git refs, you can pull in uh, whatever you want. And those are build kits, uh, you know, functionality, right? Like build kits, the underlying, like how we're building the container is, is there. And so wherever my build kit API is, and I'm assuming Dagger API is talking to build kits uh, somewhere exactly. in that process. Yeah, so if you're, if you're familiar with BuildKit, um, Dagger is essentially the core SDK is using pieces from BuildKit to, to pull these pieces together from our higher level abstraction, which is this Go SDK, uh, to actually build these containers for us. Cool, yeah, because there was a question in chat from, from Roland's here of like, if, if you're using Lima and not Docker, is there limitations there? And it seems like no, because wherever you can host the BuildKit API is, is the lowest common denominator of what features are supported. Yeah, exactly. And I think we can we can get into a tangent about that if you want to. But I think <laughs> the, one, we, the one thing we've seen there is um, actually host file system operations are sometimes different with different runtimes. So with like Lima, you might run into some edge cases there. Uh, but in general, yeah, any container runtime should be good to go. Cool. I don't want to derail you too much. You're on line like 38 <laughs> of your demo. So <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, we're, we're, we got a lot to go. No, it's, it's cool. Um, but yeah, we do, we do actually have this time. At, over on the uh, on the Dagger team that we're using like Lima, Colima, things like that as well. So yeah, we're always trying these things out too. So um, yeah, I understand the, uh, the the impulse there for sure. Yeah. All right. So jumping back in, so we, we've just done this build, right? So we've we've built our our web service. We have a Go binary, and now we have to put that in a container that we can push up to ECS and actually run it. Um, so now. Uh, if you've worked with multi-stage builds before, that's what we're doing. So instead of deploying this whole Golang latest container with our thing in it, we're going to make a new container uh, that's just Alpine. And we're going to, again, build that container for our specific platform. So we're doing two different platforms once again. Um, and then within that container, we're going to build in that, or we're going to pull in that um, build output, right? So just like a copy from that you might see in a Docker file, this is exactly what's happening here. We're saying... Uh, we've got this new container that's Alpine, and we're going to say make its FS the the base FS with our builder file as well. So just with these lines here, this is the same as a copy from where you've pulled in that build artifact, and we'll set that container's entry point to our binary. And then next thing we do is we push it, right? So uh, we we grab a container, we say publish. And we add uh, all of our variants in. So again, remember up here, we created this slice of containers. And then as we built these two containers, we added that to that slice. And so when we publish, we pass that in. And we say, I have these two architectures of the same container. Push them up to this specific ref. And so we'll push that up to ECR. And that's so automatically now this... joining that metadata into being one image with both architectures. Exactly. So we'll push up and we'll have that manifest that says, here's my two images with their appropriate architectures. And then again, we're in, we're in Go code doing all this. So now once that's pushed up, we can actually use the AWS SDK and grab a session for ECS and tell it to update our service, right? So we just, after that's deployed, we just say, hey, here's my ECS service greetings. Go ahead and force a deployment on that. And that's it. So we, we've done this automatic update. Um, there's other ways, obviously, that you could wire that in, but this is right in our pipeline, just using the SDKs we have available. Now, I didn't um, see that... anywhere in here the production quality sleep five seconds. Like That seems like <laughs> Sure, a... yeah. This isn't production ready until you're waiting for that image and then you, you deploy, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. That's uh, We cheated a bit because you know we have this uh, deployment time that happens within ECS and within Fargate where we have to you know, provision a runtime for a new container and do that. So we've wasted a bunch of time talking through things. So now when I curl again, we'll actually see our updated message on that endpoint, right? Um, so super cool. Just in the, this little pipeline, you know, we've we've built this image. It's a pretty simple image, um, but we've been able to push that up and deploy it to ECS. Now, what about testing, right? So this 
this kind of linear thing you could do with like a, a Docker build X and a, a push. Um, but one thing that's, that's harder to do across environments, especially locally versus whatever you have in your CI environment is like your specific testing environments. And so here we have another pipeline called test, right? And in this case, uh, we have our particular test matrix of like, we want to test on those two platforms. Yeah, but we also want to test on multiple Go versions. And we have this very strictly defined environment from which we expect our code to run. And so without just running, you know, go test on my command line, that has all these things that might be different on my machine versus CI. And so by defining your whole pipeline as something that you can run anywhere, now we've declared everything we need for that test and we can run, you know, build matrices as complicated as, complicated as we want without uh, writing a bunch of hard to read YAML, right? So in this case, we've written this test pipeline where we say, you know, don't worry about all these directories where you know we might be um, invalidating caches based on things that don't affect the Go code. Um, give me these two Go versions. Give me these two platforms. And then for each of the combinations of those things, um, build that kind of similar container that we saw before that we did the Go build on, but run a Go test in it. And then grab the output of all those tests and dump them on my machine. And so we can run this on our machine or you know, we can run this in GitHub. And now this is 19 lines of YAML. Most of it's just setting things up, right? But this is the, the key line here of this go run task or go run and then my my entry point and the task. Um, and so we, we've been able to tell it, um, you know, do this complicated matrix, set up this specific environment and run these tests um, just by passing this one thing in. Um, and then you want to run the same pipeline on Circle CI. The YAML's almost as condensed as that one too. We just have this go run test. You see a few other things like Hemu because again we're targeting multiple platforms, so we can actually emulate those architectures within this test. Um, and setting up, you know, that Justin, you asked about like connecting to Docker. We set up this Docker connection so we can actually run that uh, engine container. And so if we hop back over to Firefox, we can see uh, and let things load here. So yeah, we, we ran these tests in GitHub Actions and our test passed over here. You can see actually that the two ARM64 tests uh, took a little bit longer, right? Because again, that's on Kimu. It's emulated versus our, um, our AMD64 tests that are running on the host architecture that were super fast. Uh, and then we ran the same pipeline in CircleCI and again, let's see how the timing was on that kind of the same story, right? But we've been able to run this build matrix in two different CIs uh, without needing to like reinvent the wheel with all of this YAML and these build matrices. Now, Kyle, in this in this particular example, um, you're running tests inside the container. Is it possible to run tests outside of the container or against the container? So, uh, so like you know, some integration test where you might spin up some containers and hit some things against it. Yeah. Yeah, like, um, for I, example, if it's a web yeah. service like this, it's returning uh, hello or hello ECS. Is there a way to um, run another container that makes that call to your service? Um, as far as I know, we can't do that right now. I could be wrong. Um, my, like, instinct with Go would be to, like, spin that up within my actual Go test unit and, and do that um, right here. But yeah, with other languages, that's a little bit harder. But yeah, I think we have something similar to what you're describing kind of in the pipeline. Um, so definitely be on the lookout for that. OK. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that also because I couldn't like I couldn't control myself. I I took these examples that Kyle did, and then I threw them over in AWS code build as well. And um, it's an even shorter chunk of YAML, but exactly the same. <laughs> and, you know, so the same thing I would run like on my command line on my laptop, that same, that same go run is the, the same thing that I ran pretty much everywhere. It made it really easy to, to make it portable between different CIs. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so this, again, like mostly boilerplate stuff here, but you really just have this one line that's doing your whole pipeline without needing to redefine that um, across, you know, your own machine or different CI platforms. 
Um, so cool. So I think uh, I promised we would do kind of that same build and push on EKS. So let's hop over to that. So uh, we'll hop over to this different repo. And if you have other questions, Actually, Kyle, before, testing, you, before you get started, uh, Mustafa yeah. has a question here. It says, uh, how do we uh, define the, uh, some role-based some role -based access control to prevent mistakenly uh, deployments to the production environment? Um, should we take care of that part from AWS roles? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the um, one of the harder things about making CI pipelines portable, uh, in my opinion at least, is the environment and the secrets, right? So usually if you've set up this whole pipeline within GitHub um, and you said like, here's my thing, you might also have like all of the required secrets defined in this GitHub uh, rather than something that is going to be portable across different environments. And so something that uh, we've played around with and we're closer to like a really proper solution for is building that secrets engine into Dagger itself rather than like loading it through like an SDK uh, or some other path. And so by using secrets like that, then you can say like, yeah, me as a developer, I have access to deploy to this dev service, uh, but I hopefully don't have access to like redeploy prod or something, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I suppose at that point you're you have to trust the 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 secret authority, right? And wherever that's coming from. And so like GitHub Actions, you could do OIDC calls to get yep. those temporary secrets directly from AWS and say, okay, this repo under these con constrained conditions, we can call this OIDC endpoint. You can create that trust relationship to get authentication. But me as a developer on my local machine, I'm a completely different environment. I'm a different trust level of what I can do and what my local machine can do versus the CICD that we have processed and, and verified trust in over time because that trust just builds over time and create a new developer, give them a laptop and say, okay, don't, don't break prod is not really the, <laughs> the best way to go about it. You do have to build up that trust and you have to make sure that those controls are in place depending on what the risk is. Absolutely, yeah. Where, where is that, if, if Dagger is owning the secrets, I obviously have to trust Dagger um, to be able to do those calls. Is it doing something similar? Because at, at some level, Dagger has an SDK and then says, okay, that SDA calls out to, are you going to GitHub? Are you going to AWS? Are you going somewhere else to get those credentials? Lots of people do it with vaults. Do you do that other yeah. ways? It's just like, we store all our secrets here. How does that work inside of Dagger to get those either dynamic or different levels of trust? So in the same way that that vault, or sorry, the Dagger as an engine meets you where you are in terms of your CI platform, um, you want to do the same thing with your secrets, right? You've already probably, hopefully got some secrets engine running somewhere that has everything configured. You have a whole team is managing that. And so what you want to be able to do is basically create an interface to that from your Dagger pipeline um, rather than uh, loading up the whole environment in you know, a GitHub environment or something, right? So you would, when you load up the Dagger engine, you would provide the interface to say your Vault instance and give it no IDC uh, access or um, to AWS SSM or, or whatever secrets engine you're using, right? And you would say, this is how I define my secrets. Maybe give an interface to like, this is what a key looks like and it gives me back the whole environment or a specific value. And, and I think that's the way that we're imagining that you can interact with that. Yeah, so we're not, definitely not like it's it's not on our horizon right now to be you know taking over for those you know secrets vaults or anything like that. That's that's not that's not our deal. So, um, but you can certainly you know pull those in as needed and uh, yeah and yeah like Kyle said, meet you where you're at. You use what you're using today. Don't have to change it. And I know there are people's jobs that is like a copy paster secrets from like I <laughs> I control I am and I can paste it over in GitHub and I have that authority to copy and paste those things. And now Dagger can do that programmatically, right? We can give authentication to Dagger to say, hey, go fetch the secrets on demand from whatever the back end is instead of a person saying, give me the secret, copy, paste it over in this environment. And we can do that on, on a per run basis to be able to have a lot more fine grained controls when they expire. We don't have to worry about like, oh, we can set short lived tokens because we can get it every run. Exactly. Yeah. And that process yeah. all being in Git, et cetera. Right. So a lot of actual advantages to visibility and, and automation that, but you know, with some sane control around it still. Right. Well, yeah. 
Awesome. So let's talk about Kubernetes. So in this case, we've got the same service that we saw at the beginning of the demo. Um, it just has a listener and it prints hello. Um, but this time, instead of deploying into ECS, we've actually deployed it into EKS. So you can see I have this uh, deployment YAML, and it's like pretty boilerplate, but we've got two replicas. We deploy this image, and we're running a different tag here. And we have this port that listens. And so you can imagine for this Kubernetes example that um, you know our our CD process of how we how things happen post merge is kind of handled by you know Argo or whatever we have set up. But we have this development cluster where as I'm working on things on my machine, I want to be able to deploy pods and deploy things around to see this in like a you know a full environment that has sample data and these kinds of things. Uh, so this is our, our theoretical ecosystem here. And so we've got this dev tag that we're working on. And we have this little service that just provides a load balancer for that uh, deployment. And we have that listing on 80. Uh, so if we jump back to our terminal and jump over here, we can say get pods. And oh, that worked. Thank you. Um, and we can see we've got two pods running there. Um, and we can say curl. And actually, before I curl that, let's look at the deployment. Uh, so our service was hello EKS. Uh, and we've just got this deployment in the default namespace uh, that has the two replicas running um, with this specific image in that port. Uh, we can look at the service real quick. And again, that's got um, this load balancer listing on port 80. So if we go ahead and curl that, and yep, that's the right URL, we can see it's saying hello. So our production app is ready for updating. Uh, let's look at the pipeline real quick. So most of this pipeline is actually the exact same as one before, right? So we're just building this multi-platform image, uh, building our Go application uh, just with a standard environment and Go build. We're deploying that um, multi-stage build onto an Alpine base uh, and then uploading that except to the dev tag this time. And now instead of using the AWS SDK, we're actually using um, the Kubernetes uh, client Go package uh, to talk to Kubernetes. So there's a few different ways you can do this, right? So you can do this like this in our Go code where we say, hey, we just published this and we get this uh, full image ref back. And so give that to my deployment and say, move on to this. Because again, we're running this like development thing where I made a change to this um, the service on my machine, and I want to see it in this dev cluster. So we want to deploy this right away with this uh, this ref. So we go on to this deploy function uh, using that Go client again. We we get a Kubernetes client, um, and so it passes that back for us. And then we just pass that client and our image ref to this other function where we say get the deployment to the default namespace because again we have that hello EKS running in the default namespace, and then get our specific deployment called hello EKS. And on that deployment, change that image to our new ref, and then update that deployment. So this is one way you could go about it, right? You could write this code using client go. But since we have this whole SDK to work with containers, you could also pull down, say, an image that has cube, cube control or has um, you know, whatever pre-baked tools that you need to interact Elmer, with your environment. Whatever, right, yeah. Exactly. So you'd pull down whatever images you need to work with and run things in those image images if you didn't want to, like, write this Go code to do these things. Um, so let's go ahead and make a change to this and run our deployment real quick. So we'll say hello EKS. And then we're going to run this. And we'll see, we'll kind of look at the, the output this time because uh, things happen a bit faster in our EKS cluster uh, since everything's already provisioned for us, right? So, so that, that all those cached, 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 that's again, the advantage, right? Of doing this in containers and with build kit inside and, and all that good stuff, right? So things that didn't need to be rerun, we just got them cached, so. Yeah, so I've got kind of the base of my whole pipeline of like pulling in the Golang image, doing those things. We don't need to do that every time uh, we run because this engine that I have already has that. It's already done it recently. It's like, okay, I got this. Uh, but the actual work we want to do, like actually doing the Go build, that's 
done. It took six seconds. And then we um, put that into our uh, deployment image. And then we get this. Uh, we've pushed that up to ECR. So we have all the, the manifest information here. And then it says it's updated our deployment. So now if we say um, get pods, uh, we can see they just started running a minute ago. And if I do that curl again, we have that updated message. And again, our manifest was like 2F6A. So if I look at that deployment again, we can see our deployment is updated to be running that. Um, again, dev environment, you probably wouldn't manually change refs on your production service. You'd probably use some GitOps process to do that, but you can still use this pipeline to be building your images. Um, and then uh, one other thing I wanted to look at. So we have this image and I just wanna prove to you all that we did a, a multi-arch image. Um, so I can say uh, Docker build X rules inspect, and then we'll put that manifest there. And then we can see we've got those two platforms on that manifest. So that's the EKS thing. We, we deployed the cluster with uh, EKS control. So it was super easy. I just ran like one command and I've got this whole cluster um, and was able to deploy my application to it. Okay, three things. First of all, yes. I just learned about image tools and specs. I did not know that was a thing. That was <laughs> awesome. I, I, I have needed that all the time and I've had other tools, wrapper scripts that are in the past. So I'm gonna keep using that. That looks awesome. awesome. Second, uh, this really calls out the importance of, of caching to speed up a lot yep. of this, right? Like having having a uh, build kits service, having it centrally managed, this is on your laptop, you're caching those images, but if, across a team, across CICD, I saw in your uh, GitHub runners that you had a cache endpoint to be able to mount the file system to restore that cache every time you do those runners. But that's super critical because otherwise you're, you're losing a lot of that, like, mm -hmm. hey, I just download this, don't make me do it again. Yeah. Um, so that's really cool. And third, uh, may I suggest you also, because patching that image, like you said, is, is a little bit, uh, maybe you don't want to do that in prod. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, CD Kates is, is like the CDK for Kubernetes. And, nice. and we just recently, uh, the CD Kates Plus went GA. Uh, I think it was last week, maybe the week before. Oh. So as, as a possible improvement to your demo, um, it does also support Go. And so you can write the entire manifest. You don't have any YAML. You write it in CDKs. Yeah. And, and then you have, I think CDKs plus, it gets you a service and a deployment in like five lines. Um, so there's nothing, nothing. It just templates most of it. It's like, yeah, port, image, and name. And that's pretty much all you need. Um, so as a, as a possible improvement in the future, uh, might be cool to look at how that integrates into, we're already writing all this Go code. We already have the CICD process, just like you did with the ECS call with the ECS SDK. You don't need to write the YAML here either because you can do that inside of Go code as well. That's awesome because actually I wish I knew about that a week ago because I was <laughs> looking at like it building didn't exist deployments in YAML. And yeah, it was it yeah. was like, you can build these really gross looking unstructured things and that can be your YAML in code. And I'm like, no, we will not show that on, on yeah, a YouTube stream. CDKs <laughs> has been out, out for a little while. CDKs Plus just nice. went GA. So if you want to reuse it, um, it supports, I forget which versions of Kubernetes, 23, 24, 25, uh, I think are the, the main ones for CDKs Plus, but uh, Go is one of the languages. So it'd be cool to you know write some of that as well. Oh yeah, no, that's super cool. Yeah. I, it's, it's funny, I was just having a call with somebody uh, last week and they were showing me the way that they built out their whole uh, code pipeline with CDK. And so like that kind of blew my mind that someone was not just building, you know, infrastructure, other infrastructure, but they were building their whole pipeline instead of YAML, they were using CDK. So now I'm like psh, extra, you know, double blown mind here. I don't know, it's pretty awesome. We so did get also a question. Oh, yeah. from, from comments about sending explicit kubeconfig uh, in the pipeline runs. Um, you're, you're calling those APIs in the Go code. If you have a kubeconfig or a uh, limited set, like we need to pass to it for our back instead of Kubernetes, is that possible? Yeah, so let's, let's expand this uh, scary function at the bottom. That's what we're doing here. Um, in this case, we're actually getting a um, session for EKS and we're using that describe cluster to actually build our cube config uh, just in memory and passing that to uh, the client go for um, for Kubernetes. There's probably some slicker ways to do this. I made a comment that I, I got help from some Stack Overflow on that because 
Um, this was a new pattern for me. And again, like this is a bunch of stuff where you could also do if you have a cube config is load up an image that has cube control in it and give it that cube config and say, do a rolling deployment and save all of this code. Or if you really, really like writing Go code and want to do it this way, it works too, right? Yeah, I guess it depends on if you up, want to upfront that. I need a I need a certificate, right? Like I need to be have some identity. How do you get that identity to a container or a runtime? And you could create images and do that. Probably not the most secure if you're just storing the secrets for you know that certificate inside the cube config in the image. You also can get cube control backends again, like vaults or things that can say dynamically give me this based on my trust of who you think I am, and yep. or or you can do it manually in the code itself, which is is the most labor intensive, uh, but you have the most control over it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, once yeah, tying back to that, you know, tying into your secrets engine using vaults or SSM or whatever it happens to be, you could you would probably store all of that information there, and so the appropriate role gets the appropriate configuration. Right. Yeah, I assume the 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 premise for that question um, was to deploy to different environments. I think that was the the, the intent there. Um, so like once once you've deployed to a like staging environment, then how do I deploy to production if uh, it you know passes my tests? In yeah. Staging. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's the beauty of this, right? So you could have you know multiple pipelines in here, one that's doing fully you know kind of dev test, et cetera, type of thing. and uh, and then later, if everything's passing looking good, you could you know, swap in something else and, and push that to prod or, you know, uh, and benefit from all the caching that had been done previously. Yeah. I was, I was typing a reply here to uh, definitely Romino uh, that about CD Cates and, and OpenShift. We didn't mean to, uh, you know, derail this, but, but CD Cates yeah. is really about making code become YAML. It, it's, it can take that and, push it into the spec you need, and then push that into an API. OpenShift is a platform. There's OpenShift's command line tool. There's a lot of tools on top of a standard Kubernetes cluster that OpenShift has. Uh, you can, I believe, CDKs would work on OpenShift as well, because OpenShift will, ex will accept the same Kubernetes manifest. But how do you get that manifest file, that YAML, that data that the API needs? Lots of different ways customize, there's, you can write the manifest themselves, you can do Helm, which takes templates and shoves it into YAML, lots of ways to get the YAML. How do you get that to an API? And an OpenShift is a way to accept that YAML and extends it in a lot of different ways with different services inside the platform. CDKates is one way to generate the data you need. And so CDKates, the, the default language is just a, a line for line, basically spec of Kubernetes. CDKates plus says, hey, we can just assume more defaults, or you can write your own library. These are libraries, you can import them. You can have an internal library for your team and say, hey, every team writes this code and they do it the same way. So now you can import it and you can import that into Dagger. And you could say, hey, I have a platform team. Someone wrote a library for me. Every one of our services is written in this language, opens this port, has this sort of, you know, even like base uh, registry. Right? Like you don't even need to type out the whole registry. You can just say like, oh, what image is off the base registry? And you can import that and then extend it inside your code, which then generates the entire manifest and sends it to the API. So CDKs is, is more about how do we get that data generated and consistent? And you can do it with libraries, uh, which is really powerful as Dagger is showing right here. Yeah, we, we love getting rid of writing YAML. And if you can have your code do that for you, then two thumbs up for me. Oh, yeah. Hey, Kyle, do you have like that point where you pull in the SDK, the AWS SDK into the uh, into the code? I mean, just I think up at the top. Yeah, just, just, even just the top, um, import. Even. Oh, the actual import. Yeah. 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 I think that's like useful for people to see, too, just to get a sense that this is just a Go program. And so you can pull in whatever. Right. And so right on line nine, you see where the dagger um, where Dagger's package is being brought in, right? So that's what giving you all the Dagger capabilities to talk to the Dagger engine and use that API. And then, yeah, if you want to, in our case, we're using the AWS SDK as well. Um, but you can see like there's a number of things, including that Kubernetes uh, client go in there. Um, but yeah, so there's, it's, it's ready to like integrate and, 
and bring in things and make a complete solution with. So um, curious to see what people build. Yeah. What languages are supported right now in Dagger? I saw questions. Uh, Chris was asking about Q and Golang, and Solomon's replying about you know different engine versions. What's supported now? If I if I go in and jump into Dagger, uh, what should I expect? Is like I could write in these languages with these levels of support. Yeah. No. Definitely. So first thing, come to you know go to Dagger IO, click on the link. You'll see you know for the Discord. Pop in and say hi. Um, what you're going to be seeing really soon there's some some dev channels in there where you get kind of the latest and greatest of what's happening but you can definitely see that um today we've got support for golang our go sdk also the q sdk for folks that were using dagger previously and when we're using q language um that's still around right and then you'll see other languages that people are uh doing experiments with soon to be releasing as well things like python things like typescript those things are all in active development and uh, will be released soon. And we also have um, on that main Dagger.io webpage, there's a link to, uh, to a type form where you could put in, you know, I want this language. And I've seen come across like, I want Rust, that's come across. I want, uh, you know, C Sharp, I want X, Y, or Z. We're still waiting on the Groovy. It's probably there now if I go back and look, but right. I'm so, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And so just, you know, um, yeah, I think it's actually like, uh, is that you Kyle showing that there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you, uh, if you scroll up, yeah, there's some different ways there. And if you scroll up towards the, uh, towards the top there, there's a, uh, there's a link right in there. Yeah. For exactly. Let us know what SDK you're looking for. It's right there on that next paragraph. So, yeah. Definitely let us know um, those and the, uh, you know, as, as the cool thing, I think that that's really neat about this is um, when you see, like I've been playing with, you know, the kind of the Python SDK that's, uh, you know, on, on the way and the, and the TypeScript SDK, they all use just very much like the CDK from AWS. Every one of them feels like you're using the language. So, you know, if, it, if camel case is the right thing or snake case or kebab case or whatever is the right way of, of doing variables, that's all in there. But at the same time, it feels like, you know, it's the same API. You totally feel like, oh, this same thing, like with mounted directory, with worked or, you know, a container from this image, it, it all feels the same. So really, like if you're using Dagger on any of them, you can really say, oh, yeah, I see what's happening. I see what's happening but it gives you the full power of whatever your language of choice is. Uh, another question, which I know we, we kind of addressed earlier about differences between Dagger and, and Argo or something else that's your, your runner for how this code is being run, right? Because so Dagger, we're defining how to build something, how to release something, um, but that needs to be orchestrated somewhere, right? You, Kyle can do it on his laptop. He can write the commands, but uh, I don't know if you have the, the CICD, the uh, GitHub, or the runners there, you still need to orchestrate it somewhere in your code that like, I need some place to run this thing. Dagger's just defining what's being run inside that smaller environment. Exactly right. Yep, that, yeah. you nailed it. So like, you know, Kyle, kind of like one of the things you think about is kind of like triggers or events is one way to think about it. Like, why should this run now? You know, why should this Dagger pipeline that does all this important stuff building images, pushing them, all that. Why, but why should it happen now? And typically you'll have in something like, you know, whatever your CI provider is, you know, something changed in Git typically, right? Developer pushed a change that triggers, let's run a build, let's run some tests. And if it makes sense, maybe let's deploy or, you know, push something. Yeah, even in this example here on screen, if you get pushed to main, right? Like that, that's the only branch we yep. care about. We're only going to run this if we push to main. Any other dev branch, we don't even care. Dagger's not in, in play. We're not running this pipeline at all. Um, but the GitHub runner will, will know at some point, like, oh, we pushed to main. Okay, now let's run this thing. And then Dagger takes over and says, okay, I know what to do now. Here's everything that needs to happen in that environment because something in this constrained case changed. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, just just to reiterate those um, like requirements. Like, notice we're not actually installing like anything called Dagger in here, right? Like, we're just running on Ubuntu latest. Uh, we're setting up Go, and then we're running our our Go code because it's portable, right? So you can run this anywhere that anywhere. If you're building Go today, then you probably have some build environment that has Go. You could run a Dagger pipeline that's written in Go. 
So a couple of other questions have come in. Um, there's a question from uh, Definitively Romino, uh, says that uh, found by migrating to different clouds, I have to relearn how to run pipelines uh, because each has its own intricacies. Uh, and Dagger normalizes this, that is, uh, gives you portability between clouds. Is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think our goal is to be able to give you something like this that just says, like, this is my pipeline, this go run main go. I don't care about the rest of this stuff. So give me like a boilerplate so I can run this on my CI. So if I run on Circle CI, I get this this 20 lines of boilerplate with my pipeline in it or multiple pipelines. Like if you look at uh, the CI configuration for the actual Dagger repo, you'll see, you know, we still broke things up into separate uh, logical tasks so that they can run, uh, you know, in parallel or on different environments within GitHub, but it's still kind of the same, like, here's my pipeline. There's no other configuration needed. There's no like env, there's no uh, matrix. There's none of that stuff in my YAML. So right. now, now to ask, you know, a little more clarification, my make files with bash were pretty portable in these environments, yeah. right? Like I, I could write a make file and I could execute that inside of pretty much any environments, but it seems like one of the major benefits here is that context switching of like we mentioned early on, I don't have to teach anyone how to write a make file They're They are scary and, and really hard and difficult to get into, but I have a lot of developers that know TypeScript, they know go, Hey, now we can help you leverage the ecosystem of the tools you already know and not care about the rest of, you know, make files and bash and all these other, in, you know, pieces that are, are likely to go wrong if someone's not an expert in those areas. No, totally. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've, for example, like with the TypeScript SDK, when you see that, you could imagine a team just in their package JSON. There's, you know, node dagger dot, you know, dot TS in there or something, you know, dot JS. And you, boom, just like, you know, you run a, uh, you run a node script or you run a Python program or whatever, a run a Go program. And yeah, it, whatever your current workflow is, um, it becomes really, really easy to fit that into that ecosystem of tooling that you're probably used to for running tests or other like dev automation tasks. Right. The, the, the inner loop of my dev cycle now extends a little further into my CACD because my, my inner loop of like, oh yeah, rerun, go test all the time is going to be the same instead of saying like, oh, now I need to make deploy. Like, okay, now what happened? Yeah. And it's a completely different opaque sort of process. Another question I saw in here from Chris was, how does this relate to something like Terraform? Um, where do you draw that line of like, I'm infrastructure versus building versus the code that runs on top of it? Yeah, that's a great question because you can use Dagger to run Terraform if you want to. Um, you could also use Dagger to run, you know, the Terraform CDK or the AWS CDK. Um, but it works really nicely if Dagger is your workflow for doing tasks. You know, this, this is an example right here of, running Terraform, right? Because I mentioned this um, ECS example uses Terraform to deploy all of its resources to AWS. And so if we pass this in with apply, then it'll actually pull down a Terraform image and mount my Terraform directory into this image, uh, add my Terraform cloud token, and then run my command. So I don't need to manage Terraform versions locally on my machine because my tooling that is managed by myself or my team has this like declared environment of how Terraform gets run. Yeah. And the other thing there that's nice is, you know, by having a separation on the infrastructure side, you know, tools like, you know, CDK and Terraform, um, they've got, they're really, really good at like having this declarative uh, way of defining what you want and then also knowing what the state is so that you can get and you know, reconcile those things. Um, whereas, you know, with Dagger, we're kind of these relatively, you know, these stateless pipelines that just, just go and do whatever you want. And so it makes a great compliment to say like, Hey, CDK or Terraform or whomever, Bloomy or whatever, just you take care of making sure that the infrastructure I need is in place. And then the Dagger pipeline is going to run on top of that, you know, maybe even triggering that. Um, I have a quick question. So. Are there plans to uh, integrate with SNCC or other vulnerability scanners to identify vulnerabilities in container images that are built uh, through through Dagger? Uh, and, and how would that manifest itself? Like uh, if you were to build a, a pipeline, 
with, with Dagger and say a uh, scanner found a, a critical vulnerability, could you um, accept the um, the suggestions that SNCC offers and uh, build a new container image from a different like uh, base or a different uh, image? Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that's a great question. In yeah. theory, yeah, like if they if they provide an interface to to do that through code or some image um, that they provide for their tool that you can run that um, for sure, right? Like I've we didn't show it today, but I've run examples where we use um, cosine and and other tools to sign images and um, do things like that that interact with the registry we're pushing to, um, and you can imagine like a a scanner could fit into that same workflow. Yeah. Now I'd be curious to see like with ECR scanning or with, you know, sneak and Docker, right. and them, you know, what, there's like a lot of potential. And I saw, I saw mage go on the, the yes, I saw that too. Yeah. 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 So absolutely. Mage is something that we, we've actually adopted a bit inside dagger once we discovered it and we've used it um, because yeah, like if you're using, if you like make, but, you don't want you don't like phonies and weird stuff there and make files, but you just want that capability um, with Go. Mage is really really cool. Cool. This is this is great demo. Thank you so much uh, for coming on and showing it to us. Thank you everyone for uh, for joining in on the chat and asking questions, um, and Solomon for answering some of them in chat. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> able to help us out there. And so, uh, if anyone is interested in getting started with Dagger, go check out Dagger.io. Um, there's a Discord that we linked earlier that you can jump in, ask your questions there. Uh, it looks really cool, and I, I'm excited to see how it grows with more languages. I'm really interested to see how the cross-language uh, uh, portability is going to work uh, because that's the separation for a lot of teams who who owns different things and who own, who writes what language. Or this no longer do you have to say like, oh, I only do TypeScript. Let's convert everything to TypeScript. It's like, oh, well, here I wrote the Go here now, just deploy it that way. So I'm I think that's going to be really cool. So. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming and uh, we will see you all. Uh, I think we actually have a show tomorrow. So uh, stay tuned, uh, subscribe to Containers from the Couch and uh, we'll talk to you all later. See ya. Thanks guys.